Milwaukee, that's why. So bear with me as I kind of get everything situated. Hello, hello. This is Cam with Hope to Canine Foundation and Q&A Friday, Fix It Friday is back. So let me go ahead and just open my stream screen here and set the camera to a better, a better angle. Hey, hey, let me know where you're watching from. And if you submitted a question, I should have them in my email from my lovely assistant, April. I do not love this at all. What's up with this? Let's see, guys. Comment if you're here. Let me know where you're viewing from. And then let me see if I can't clean this up a little bit. We've got a few questions today, the first of which for you Instagram viewers, Facebook peeps, hello, Instagram's over here. So if I keep doing this, we're sharing community today. Um, the first question that we had submitted today had to do with blending a newly adopted dog, both bull terriers. So that's going to be a fun one to speak to. Blending a newly adopted dog, they're not getting along, things seem to be a little bit wonky there. But also, um, the owner indicated that there are some health issues, maybe, maybe deaf and blind, if I recall correctly, I'll look at the question. The other one that came through was an issue of barking. So a pack of three dogs, one in particular, is causing trouble barking. Hey, April, thanks for being here, my fabulous assistant. Um, I don't like, I don't like this. This is going to be an adjustment, guys. Something's changed with um, how it is to stream live on Facebook on laptop. Not my favorite view ever. So let me just give a second here for folks to pop in the room. Hey, thanks Insta folks for joining us. Jessica, hello, good morning, Carmen. Nice to see you guys. Hey, 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 welcome, welcome. Um, let me take a look here and see if I can fix this at all. Nah, no likey, that's okay. I'll fix this. Bit by bit, guys, we're gonna hit the ground running. The other thing we're gonna, the other topic I wanna speak to um, provided we have time, which I believe we will. And if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the comments. April can pin them for me and make sure that I don't miss them. The other topic I want to speak to, though, let me know if my audio gets a bit better here with this change, is um, an owner surrender inquiry that we had. Uh, they were struggling with containment. So they had gotten a dog um believe this was an adoption situation april can correct me if i'm wrong they've gotten a dog and have issues with it walking off the property hoa is on their butt about it and um reaching out for surrender and it's like ooh, this is a fixable problem right so real um important that we speak to that issue and you know kind of just talk about accountability here for dogs that that you bring into your lifestyle and your environment that don't have prior training or off-leash reliability or just an innate, you know, natural tendency to want to have pack drive and stay close to you it really is so utterly unfair not to provide containment solutions or the teaching process to build that dog's boundary understanding. So uh, that one's kind of at the bottom of my list pending our time and availability to tackle it. And um, Hopefully we'll get there, yeah. Family dog of six years before it moved to the new home or it was a new behavior. We'll get it clarified, guys. I'm gonna pull up the list in my cell phone. So thanks for popping into the room here. It takes just a second to get everything loaded and organized. Um, if you're brand new to our broadcast, I'm Cameron. I am the founder and president of Hope 2 Canine Foundation. So my background is as a dog trainer and behaviorist and rescuer. And I also now coach dog-based business owners. So if you're a dog trainer, if you have a dog daycare, if you are a rescuer and you want to establish a nonprofit or you have a rescue already and it isn't running the way that you want it to, you don't love it, hit me up guys because these are the things that I love to speak to from my experience of making mistakes and figuring things out. So a lot of times, just FYI, Fix It will cover that whole spectrum. Sometimes I'm getting questions about how to navigate uh, secondhand dog situations, rescue processes and systems, fosters, things like that. Other times it's dog owners and sort of more common family home issues or behavior modification issues. And then sometimes it's a trainer with a really juicy question about how to navigate a particular client dynamic or um, their program set up for their business, how to, how to create programs and things that are working better for them or that they love. 
Um, having a cup of tea with you guys today. Does anybody else do what I do? I, I, I tend to blend bags. I tend to do that. It's kind of a weird thing, I think. I put two separate, different flavors. Um, so, all right, I'm going to dive right in here. Welcome to the broadcast and our first question. And I thank you so much, folks. Uh, Jill and Jennifer submitting these first couple of questions. I appreciate that. So Jill had asked, I have a nine-year-old female rescued English Bull Terrier, and I've had her for two years. Just rescued another English Bull Terrier male. They're both fixed. The male is six years old, partially blind and deaf. They were both supposed to be good with other dogs, but so far I'm having a hard time with them. On walks on a leash, they seem to be fine, but in the house seems to be tension, like they do want to play, but with their rough play style, I'm a little afraid that the male will hurt the female. She's getting older and with some arthritis, but she's still a go-getter. There's been some dust-ups and it's been awful, but with research, it seems that not so uncommon and just like some advice on how I can make them closer or how to be more relaxed when they seem like they want to play and I get nervous. Thank you. I've had the mail for just about a month, so I know it takes time. Jill, um, fabulous, you know, just ownership and perspective on that. It absolutely does. Um, it's several weeks for your dog just to settle in, several months for them to really know their place. And that's also where we'll see both relaxation and entitlement really kick in, right? Um, but you're also talking about being um, a little anxious, that you're describing yourself as feeling a little anxious and insecure as an owner, and that's not helpful, right? So number one, I applaud you for opening yourself up to support and just feedback in case there's something that can help that you might be missing. Hey, Katie, beer o'clock, yeah. Um, you know, number, number two, um, you know, also thank you for adopting. Uh, that's amazing of you that you gave these two dogs homes, especially special needs. That's not always easy and straightforward for people to do. So really cool, good on you for doing that. Um, in this case, I think we really wanna tackle you first and foremost, if I may. We really wanna talk about the fact that your dogs are gonna follow your lead and you did inherit some baggage in both cases that is outside your control. But ultimately, the behavior, the relationship that they form is going to be a reflection of that leadership that they feel in the environment they're both in now, okay? Oh, this is cool, you guys. By the way, plug for um, the coffee company. Sip coffee, save pups, rub bellies. I'm trying to remember. Um, I'll have to look them up for you. Dang it. Anyway, um, what can you do in this case? Well, number one, how much time are you spending one-on-one -on -one with each of these dogs? Because I think that, you know, if you have to remember when you become a multiple dog owner, and this will speak to the next question as well. Um, it's just like when you have multiple kids. Certain things happen that make it easier. They keep each other company, perhaps. They play together, sure. However, you also end up with them influencing one another. You end up with them ganging up on you. You end up with them, um, you know, feeling slighted that they're not getting individual attention that they desire or need. Um, and oftentimes it makes us kind of start to get a little bit lazy or we cut corners and we avoid certain things because our plate is more full, right? It's more overwhelming to meet everyone's individual needs. And now we have dogs, kids as well, that aren't getting everything that ideally they would get. Now, I would argue that in some cases, this is perfect because it means that um, you know, we, we mitigate those issues of entitlement. We mitigate those issues then of a dog that has codependency perhaps, right? Because we're asking them to be a part of a pack. We're asking them to have more autonomy, to socialize with their buddy. Um, they're, they're getting that resonance with their own kind. Um, but if you have behavior issues already in an existing dog or dogs, it's going to influence the other dog and or vice versa. Oftentimes is that that happens as well. OK, so um, the, you know, the first thing, how much time are you spending one on one with these dogs? Because this is going to inform you a little bit more clearly. Hey, Alexis, welcome, everybody. Good to see you guys. Thanks for tagging Jennifer Carrie Ann as well. Um, this is going to inform a little bit more of your confidence around how she's doing, what does she need, what is she capable of, um, and to feel okay restricting them, all right, if that makes sense. Um, 
If you're currently worried about them building a friendship and fulfilling certain things for each other, but you're not doing your due diligence to still spend that quality one-on-one -on -one time to be able to satisfy those individual dogs as being different and having different needs, you're going to struggle with that sense of guilt, right? That's kind of coming through um, that I, I want them to be something for each other and I want them to be okay with each other, but they're not necessarily um, getting the thing that they need from one another that they ultimately need to get from you. So how much time you're spending one-on-one -on -one so that you can feel a little bit more confident about interpreting each of the dog's behavior specifically. And then, you know, what have we done to set up a structure to make them both feel safe and accountable? Uh, when I talk about blending dogs in, you know, our foster training, so we have a whole foster manual, by the way, if you're a rescuer and you want access to it, it's on our website, hope2k9.com. It should be homepage-ish maybe, or contact, uh, the contact page downloadable PDF that is editable. So it is just a, it's just a format. It's not an official um, manual that has our specific, you know, logos and icons and, you know, nuanced protocols in it. It has a formula of systems and education that I found to be really effective over the years. And that is intended for other groups or individual rescuers or fosters to download and either insert your own organization data and customize it to you or just have a reflection of another perspective on some of these things for foster training purposes. With that said, uh, Jill, it might behoove you to take a look at that. There may be some more information in there that I don't go over in detail today that helps you in how you approach this blend because there's no replacement for a great foundation. When you bring a new dog home, guys, no matter what, it's really important that you have a lot of structure, that you take your time, that you go slow, even if the dogs are both really friendly, even if they turned out to just seem like they love each other right away. I still advocate for that 30 day boot camp, basically, um, for, for doing things on leash together before you know you turn them loose to rough house, for having them both understand the concept of place or calmness and control and just coexistence before you turn them loose to go crazy and have that energy go up. Because I think you're seeing exactly why I'm advocating for this. The fits and starts of socialization that you're seeing in the dogs and that kind of like, I'm a dog and you're like me and I wanna play with you and, I, and it's my natural desire to be a part of this pack dynamic with you or to respond to your presence in my environment. If we haven't done our job to lead that with a structured you know, uh, effort and really go nice and slow to build a real desire um, that is reverent, we can see this tip from, I'm excited, I wanna check you out, I wanna maybe tussle with you to, hey, fuck off out of my space, you're coming on too strong. It's pretty common that that happens um, you know, if we haven't laid a good foundation. So I would advocate for you to take a look at our, our manual, take a look at our foster manual because uh, the template, remember it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have everything that is a law and order of Hope to Canine Foundation, but it's a template that's designed for anybody to grab and customize and to give you some sort of structure and, you know, guidelines. And within that, you're going to, you're going to see, you know, that leash stays on at all times. We use a crate. Uh, you know, walk the dogs together, place the dogs in the same environment, you know, really, really slow build and have your new dog feeling from the crate like, man, how do I get out there to be a part of that action? And then have your existing dog experiencing, okay, this new dog is not such a big deal because my owner has it handled and there's massive guidance and accountability here and I'm still doing my normal routine and that dog's just over there in a crate or on a down stay. Um, it's a lot of work, you guys, to, to do this blending thing, especially with adult secondhand dogs, if there's baggage and you've got a dog with sight and hearing limitations. So if that's been lifelong for this dog in particular, which I would suspect that it is based on the, um, oh, thank you so much, uh, potential fosters, thank you. I don't know. Huh. Interesting the way the link came out, isn't it, April? Hopefully that's the manual. Um, needless to say, if you're on Instagram, you can pop over to our Facebook page and, and April's helping us out with putting that manual that I'm referencing in the comments. All right. Um, but you can also go check out, you know, YouTube channel. We've got videos about a lot of this stuff, um, and we're constantly updating them. So 
back to um, you know your your new mail that you've had for about a month or so. If sight and hearing issues have been lifelong, then we probably have some social skill deficits or some awkwardness, right? Um, and that could be also what your female is picking up on. The other you know dog in the home, senior dog has experience. She may need to correct this dog and kind of straighten him out a little bit. Um, put him in his place and set boundaries with him about her comfort level with his forwardness or neediness or lack of, you know, just general communication skills. Um, and, you know, again, this comes back to the spending one-on-one -on -one time and really knowing your dog and giving her outlets to be supported. Hey, good to see you. I'm glad you're here, Roots Canine. Thanks for hanging out, guys. Oops. There we go. I think I paused us by accident. Anyway, um, I think you're going to you're going to have more insight if you were to come back around to me in a week or two and every day you walked these dogs individually or every day you spent that one on one time doing something of a quality manner tug of war strategic nose games you know maybe your female dog uh, with arthritis she needs to go swimming maybe she needs to get access to um, you know uh, something to help ensure that we're fortifying her health picture. Um, structurally as much as possible. These things are going to actually, I think, change the way that you ask the question. If we were to fast forward two weeks and you'd been consistent with that, I think you're going to have more intuition about, you know, what, uh, what is really at play here and what the dogs really want or need, okay? Um, at the end of the day, for those of you in, in a very general sense, blending dogs, there is no guarantee they become best friends. There just isn't. There, there is no way to positively guarantee that. They are individuals just like you and me. They are going to have their nuance, uh, like and dislike of other personalities and temperaments just like you and I. And when we adopt another dog, or uh, we really do take a risk on that. It is possible to make that blend and choice and assessment and to you know do meet and greets and evaluations to ensure a great you know greater level of success and it takes time and patience to do that it means you can't fall in love with the look of a dog and you can't be in a hurry to blend another dog in your home you have to be prioritizing objectively thanks april i see you drop that in the instagram feed too thank you so much um prioritizing that your a real rescue story is I'm adopting this dog and committing to finding out who it is and giving it what it needs, even if it's different than the picture that I thought it would be. Similar to having children. Am I right? <laughs> we don't get to choose how that goes. We don't, we don't have control over the ultimate little being that comes out and joins us on this planet. And we do have to really take that lesson in flexibility and acceptance and grace and patience and all the things um, or else we're you know in a losing battle with ourselves so Jill the last thing I want to say about your question mm, the last thing I want to say about your question is to that anxiety piece right to that overall comfort piece let me adjust you guys just a, a titch more um, to, to that end, it is incredibly important um, that you do whatever you can do in your day-to-day -day life to um, build more self-confidence and more, you know, just overall internal stability about your leadership skills and your, your handling processes with these dogs. Um, some things that are really helpful, hang on guys, I'm going to scoot you. Boy, I had to really rig this today. Some things that are really helpful that are um, connected here is like a meditation practice. Um, if you've never done that, I highly encourage you to give it a try this year, okay? Um, I highly encourage you to make that a priority of 2021, even for a 30-day experiment. So let's say you commit to the rest of the month of January. It's not even 30 days. I'm giving you a break, okay? Three weeks. You commit to the rest of the month of January, Every day you're going to spend some time in meditation. Maybe you do that with your old gal at your feet, okay? Five, ten minutes doesn't take a ton of time. And you really sit, you know, and face your shit, okay? So you're not putting it on the dogs because it's, it may be hard to connect with, but that's happening for you right now. That's happening for you right now. It's clouding your objectivity. It's clouding your ability to trust your intuition. You can't hear it because you need to slow down and sit with yourself. 
it's clouding your ability to recognize um, that this is a challenge that may or may not have a certain type of outcome, but that you're committed to these dogs and the more structure, the more discipline, the more steadily you move towards this actual blend, the more successful you're likely to be, okay? So I'd encourage you to take the next three weeks, develop a meditation practice, whatever it is, journal, something where you just sit the fuck down and put yourself on place, right? Um, that's basically what we're asking our dogs to do when we use this concept of place. It's meditation time. It's stay there, be with yourself, sit in your own skin, and forget what's going on around you. Stop thinking about what shoulda, coulda, woulda be. Stop thinking about, you know, uh, what's going to happen tomorrow or what happened yesterday. Just be right here, right now. That's it. And allow that insight and intuition to come forward of what you already know about your female dog. You already have an established bond with this dog. She might have certain boundaries. She might have certain needs that you just have to respect. And he is the, the male that you've adopted is just not a part of that picture of fulfillment and advocacy for her. That, that's okay if that truth is what comes forward for you, okay? You're not a failure for bringing him in and finding that this is not, you know, they're not besties right away because there's some intensity between the breed, the play style, his own deficits, sight and hearing component is not nothing. For these dogs to know one another and become close with, an, with one another as late game adult dogs with these issues um, is going to be tricky. It's going to take you standing in radical leadership. And that means being super connected to yourself, super in tuned, no stress, no anxiety, no excessive pressure on them, just uh, determination and commitment to seeing them for the individuals they are and giving them what they need. And then, you know, working constantly towards whatever the highest possible outcome might be. Okay. So I hope this is helpful, Jill. I know sometimes it can be like drinking from a fire hose when you're getting advice, uh, especially from me, but also it might seem, again, like kind of counterintuitive. What is she talking about? Why are we having a woo-woo conversation? But I'm a big believer that these things belong together. I think that we can't talk about, um, you know, behavior without talking about the spiritual, the energetic, and um, the practical. I think they're, they all need to be a part of your dog training process and your business journey. They're hugely interconnected, okay? So um, remove any like resistance if it comes up for you around meditation sounding like something woo-woo. It's literally me telling you to go on place. Put yourself on place, sit the fuck down, release any pressure that it needs to look a certain kind of way with these dogs. Give yourself a lot of grace for having been open and available to this, you know, adoption scenario and look at these dogs as individuals and then let's get them walking and migrating together and placing and coexisting for a lot longer before we let those dust ups and, and tussles start to happen. It's too much pressure too soon. Okay, cool. This is helpful, guys. I got some more peeps talking to me on Facebook than I do Instagram. That is groovy. No big deal. I know you guys are, hey, Ryan's here. Hello, hello. All right. Jennifer had asked, we have three dogs and one of them is a barker. The other two hardly bark. Uh, Lucy will bark as soon as she goes outside. She barks when she hears the neighbor. She barks at nothing. How do we correct this behavior? Jennifer Bell, are you here? I saw Carrie Ann tagged you. Uh, it would be really nice if you're here because I have questions for you. So in the very most basic sense, right, why do dogs bark? Um, that vocalization is going to be rooted in arousal. Um, they have a limited way of communicating. It's going to be biting, barking, growling, running. <laughs> um, and so, you know, your dog is generally one of three things in this case. Top likelihood is bored AF. Doesn't have an outlet for that arousal, that drive, okay? Um, that's generally top of the list, a source of the behavior. I got feelings and I don't have anywhere to put them because nobody's telling me where to go 
get this out of my system in a different way, okay? Um, number two, high defense, okay? Uh, sensitive dog about sights and sounds and who's there and what's that and this, my, my boxer Laszlo, high defense dog. Uh, everything is suspicious to him, okay? Super friendly, super great dog totally versatile, flexible dog. He's laying right outside on the love seat right now, just chilling. But every 10 minutes, he gets up and he does a little perimeter search. And if there's anything going on out front, if the door knocks, if somebody drives down the driveway, he's gonna bark an alert for me. The thing with him is that it doesn't happen incessantly as you're seeing or hearing, not hearing right now, because we do protection work, we do drive fulfillment outlets, we do strategic tug work, we do things to say, hey, this is where you get that out of your system. This is who you need to be defensive of when I tell you on command. And we do training to say, shut up now, and the dog understands that's a hard and fast boundary. It's not, I'm not asking, it's not a request, okay? Oops, fix my little bud here. So top of the list is gonna be a fulfillment question mark for you, Jennifer. Second is gonna be, um, hey, Larice. Second is gonna be uh, training corrections related, right? So your dog needs to be corrected. I'm glad that's, that's a helpful uh, analogy for you about place. I'm seeing some comments of, of like in that meditation concept. Um, you know, if your dog has not been corrected for this, then you're basically permitting it every time it happens and you don't disagree with it. So now it's a bad habit, right? That's a, kind of the number two thing that I see. Unfulfilled, lack of outlet, bad habit because of a lack of correction. So, you know, think about what have you done to, you know, say that's not acceptable to me, knock that shit off. And this is where things like, you know, our training programs become really popular because people struggle to share an effective and meaningful correction with a dog if they're running loose in a large area, they can't catch them. Uh, your voice doesn't mean anything because you never developed the association that I say no and here comes an aversive, so no means stop what you're doing. It's, you know, pretty darn clear behavior patterning. Um, be, you know, because in the training programs, we're gonna teach the dog all these things. We're gonna teach them what no means. We're gonna teach them what yes means. We're gonna take them from understanding those things with a leashed accountability to an off-leashed accountability through remote collar training. And it's a process. It's, a, it's graduate school, right? It's like, hey, here are the things you need to know to be good at lifing. So if you've never done that, Jennifer, you need to take several steps back and restrict your dog from practicing that bad behavior and restrict your dog from being in a situation where you can't reach her, you can't give her feedback, you can't answer to her questions, right? Of who's there, what's that? Why are we, you know, out, out here in the middle of this action or whatever the case may be. So three dogs, one's a barker, the other two hardly bark, but that doesn't mean that they're not also contributing to the problem. Sometimes in a pack dynamic, there are situations where the owner doesn't necessarily see who the real culprit is. The third thing is that your dog, Lucy, could be your canary. Lucy could be the dog that's saying, hey, uh, this pack thing is not very well organized and there's no clear, credible leader here, so I'm going to let you all know that there's a problem, right? Um, and oftentimes then again, kind of mixed in with those other two components, haven't disagreed with her in a way she cares about, haven't corrected her effectively, and she doesn't have an outlet and isn't fulfilled to have that energy and that drive drained in another way. You didn't tell me who the, what the breed is. Okay. So you didn't tell me, uh, information about, you know, your, your dog's breed. And that might give me a little bit of insight too, around the motivation behind this behavior. Some breeds, guys, you can read about it. Even if you have a mix, you can go, this is my sign for reading about it, apparently. Um, you can go online and take a look. Uh, I have a Glen of them all now. She's nine weeks old. And Glens are talkers, they're barkers. There is a more, you know, significant likelihood that that behavior is going to uh, show up and or be hard to curb in certain breeds. Um, other breeds are far less vocal and it's less of an issue. It's unlikely to be a problem. 
So if we can look at the breed and we can have some understanding of, you know, age, temperament, and breed, that will tell you about why the fulfillment issue, remember that top likelihood of a lack of outlet for this and, and guidance on, you know, the dog's arousal, that will tell you why potentially you've got a motivation for this behavior incessantly and what would be an equivalent activity that you could do to satiate this dog's drive. Um, for example, if you tell me that it's a healer or you tell me that it's, you know, a cattle dog or you tell me that it's a German shepherd, I'm going to go, yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you don't have an outlet for this dog, if you're not dictating an opportunity for it to get this out of its system in another way, I'm not surprised it's showing up here. Um, is that the case? Boston's can be absolutely more of a barker. Yes, barking breed. Um, I literally have a mug that says Bok Bok Boston. It's a, a mug that my friend brought me back from my favorite tea shop in Boston um, and with a Boston Terrier on it. And yes, they tend to be barky little dogs. You have to curb that stuff early and firmly. If you're telling me you now have a five or six year old dog that has barking issues, that's gonna be harder to quit. But if they're little, that's where you see a lot of us trainers say, just try a bonker or something. It can be pretty effective. But being proactive, again, this just like with Jill, this speaks to your process, Jennifer. You gotta be proactive. You can't quit sending your dog outside to let you down and not having a plan in place to share feedback in a timely and clear and effective manner. That's not fair. Um, it's leaving your dog assuming that she has to or can continue to exhibit these behaviors. Yeah, Meredith Frenchies too. And so what, what do we expect, right? We can't expect anything different. If you're an owner who's seeing behavior like this, start early with your dog, whether it's a puppy or, you know, a new dog you've adopted, please don't hang out in that space of assumption that these things will resolve themselves. They don't. Potty training resolves itself eventually, sure. Um, you know, having better sleep habits or creating, you know, behaviors when you stick with it resolves itself. A dog that is defensive, a dog that is insecure and fearful, a dog that is um, high drive and unfulfilled and therefore acting out, this doesn't just go away. A pack dynamic where the dogs are, you know, ganging up and exhibiting behavior as a cluster because one started something and the others joined in and you're not there to address it, that doesn't just go away. It actually compounds. A dog that is growling and backing up and threatening people because it's nervous and insecure and doesn't want someone in its space, this doesn't just go away. We need to deal with it. We need to address it. We need to guide that dog and give that dog appropriate feedback and opportunities to grow um, as much as possible, but if you leave it alone and assume it'll just work itself out, you're likely going to have a bite on your hands. You're likely going to have your dog biting somebody, and that's going to suck royally, and it also could cost that dog its life. So really important that you take these things seriously, um, especially if you're telling me this is an adolescent, this is, you know, a, a younger dog. Um, it's not just going to miraculously feel like, man, I don't really think I need to do that anymore. Um, you know, because it's boring for me now. Even if it diminishes, it's probably going to switch and manifest into something else. Taking the time to do the work, always a challenge, was just setting up some outwork after my dog picked up a bone when I stopped to let him pee. Yeah. It's hard when you have multiple dogs, guys. Um, you have multiple work. <laughs> You got multiple work. You have to think carefully about bringing another dog into the mix and having that level of responsibility for yourself. Do you have the time? Do you have the energy? Do you have the desire? This is why we, we say dog nerd cult, right? Because we want people to, hey, happy new year, Justin. We want people to approach it that way. It's like become a bit of an enthusiast trainer, become a nerd about this stuff so that you want to read it, you want to look into it, you want to study it, you know, around the edges of your life. You don't just expect that you're going to come home and suddenly, you know, your dog's going to miraculously know how to do everything you want it to do without conflict or, you know, consequence. Um, so anyway, I'm getting a little bit off on this one, but Jennifer, if you want to comment back on the live and answer some of that information for me and guys who are thinking of adding a Q&A in the future, Tell me as much as possible. It's really helpful for me to know how long have you had the dog? What have you tried already? 
Um, how old is this dog? What's the breed of this dog? This is all data that plays into our assessments and evaluations. If we're crafting a training program, if we're trying to support um, in matching dogs, blending dogs in the adoption you know, realm. Um, here goes my little defender. Uh, maybe I'm getting a delivery or something. So this is all information that's relevant and I love for you to be as detailed as possible when you send these in. If you wanna comment them into our Fix It Friday uh, question prompts next week or email them to april at hope2k9.com, please feel free to do so. Um, I'm gonna actually start to wrap us up here, but before I go, I wanna make sure that you guys are aware of our online classroom because this is such a phenomenal opportunity right now. We have an online classroom called Raising a Rockstar and it's geared towards sharing with you processes and, and tools and systems and strategy for the first year of your dog's life. This is applicable if you're raising a puppy right now. It's also applicable if you want to get a puppy in the future, even better for you to get this data proactively. It's absolutely valuable if you have a dog with behavioral issues you're trying to understand retroactively because you're gonna get a lot of insight and information about what might be going on with your dog based on what you did or didn't do in that early development uh, stage of having your dog or when you didn't have your dog. Let's say you adopted a dog, you've got baggage issues, and now you're gonna be able to see in the course of this classroom content, why might that be? And what are my opportunities for what can be improved and changed and what I'm, is, is out of my control now, okay? Um, it's literally only $27 a month to be in that classroom, guys. And I've been streaming and sharing content and writing and video and building the units, the training units, steadily over, you know, uh, every couple, three days. We just keep on dumping stuff in there. And we'll do Q&A opportunities in there as well. So please feel free to check that out. There's a link through our events tab at hope2k9.com. And April can drop that for you here as well. Someone from my team, at least. Um, that is an incredible opportunity to have access to me and my process for how do I get my dog from start to finish and have it be the rock star, the breed ambassador that I want it to be. That's my definition of a rock star. It's a breed ambassador. It's a bull terrier or it's a Sherman Shepherd or it's a Weimaraner, or it's a Glen of a Mall, or it's a Frenchie or it's a Boston or it's a Boxer or it's a Pitbull or it's some blend of those things that represent what that breed is designed and intended to be and do at the highest standard, all right? So really, really cool to be able to just show you like allowing that puppy to get corrected by adult dogs and where you have insecurity like Jill about what do I allow? What do I keep you know, going forward with and what do I need to interrupt? Um, we talk about you know, strategies for diet and, and health and vaccine approaches with puppies and all these different things going on in there that are going to be just, it's my, it's my favorite thing I've done so far. So please get in there because it's a tax deductible donation when you sign up for that recurring $27 a month commitment through the year. And it's just a no brainer. It's just a no brainer, really, really cool stuff. So come hang out with me there. Um, let's see, I just wanna make sure I didn't miss any other comments. Thanks you guys so much again for hanging out. We're gonna be doing this every Friday from now on again. We've missed you. And, um, you know, we've had some, some really amazing things happen in this year. Our, our foundation has only gotten stronger and grown. Our training services are packed into March. Um, we really, really look forward to hearing from those of you that, you know, we can support this year in private programs. If you need support with training your dog, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. We have three trainers available to book with. And um, we still offer our boarding program, which is a, a you know, solution that supports our nonprofit work and allows us to do things like this. So feel free to drop your comments. Again, weekly, you're going to see those prompts for Q&A or just email them to April if you don't want to forget what you were going to ask. And I'll be back here next Friday to chat with you. All right. Sound good? Thanks, guys. I appreciate you hanging out today. We'll keep this one nice and, and tidy and not too long. And I wish you a fantastic weekend. I'll talk to you guys again very soon, okay? I'll say goodbye to Instagram first, if I can figure out how. Bye, guys. And Facebook. Thanks so much for hanging out, guys, and commenting, interacting, and sharing a little bit of your presence with me. I love it. I'm going to get on to some more of my to-do list for today, but um, appreciate you guys submitting those questions. Thank you, Jill, Jennifer specifically, and we'll save this other topic for another day. All right, gang? Take good care. Keep me posted on how we can support you. Bye for now.